in reading this scripture over the last week and even a little bit of the previous week since it relates with last Sunday's message, it was revealed to me that your, your pastor is kind of a hypocrite. Um, as the main idea behind this is forgiveness, I realized that there were times in ministry that you, you get hurt. It just happens in church ministry. Uh, I've come to terms with that. In, in my brain, I moved past it. I was done with it. It's over. But God definitely revealed to me this week that there, there are things in my life that I just haven't forgiven other people for how they've treated me or my family or anything like that. And uh, I stand for you this morning confessing that it, it took me up until earlier this week to where I actually forgave someone. Not Again, not directly speaking to them because I don't have a way to contact them. Um, for something that happened years ago, I just never forgave them for it just how I was treated. I've shared with you a situation of a previous church that I was at that caused issues between my wife and I. Nothing nefarious or morally compromising, but it just, the pain filtered over to our relationship and it caused friction between us. And I was able to, she and I were able to go to another church and get healed from that. But it took me up to this week to just say, I can forgive them and it's over with. There's a whole bunch of stuff in our lives and I don't know what's going on in your life right now. I don't know what's going on in your world. I don't know what your relationship is to your family, your friends, people that you're around. But I do believe that God's word is presented at the right time, at the right moment. Uh, that's why I preach the way I do. So then it's not I who's picking out a sermon for each one of you, but God is presenting it, and I give it out to you. So let's go ahead and begin this morning with going before the Lord in prayer. God, just as the song says, we need you every hour. And God, when we are close to you and when you are infiltrating our lives, you bring to the surface a number of things that we have suppressed or ignored or have even forgotten about and that we need to deal with so that we can be better stewards of your Holy Spirit in our lives and be more effective in this world as we are parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, ministers of your gospel. God, my prayer this morning is that your Holy Spirit has already been at work from the time we stepped through these doors and that we chose to come and worship here that you were already doing something in our hearts and in our lives. God, my prayer is that now that you continue to bring these things to, to light in our lives so that we can be more like your son that as I've said before that when you look down here you just see your son God that is my prayer today and Father through your word that we can all even me glean something marvelous and wonderful from your word God thank you again for this time and I lift up all those who are here with us today and that your word resound in their hearts in their minds and in their ears this morning so that our tongues cannot help but proclaim your glories. God, we ask that you bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, as we understand how we don't need to be duped by Satan. Verse 5, Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure not to put it too severely to all of you. Very first point, unforgiveness causes church-wide pain. Unforgiveness causes church-wide pain. Unforgiveness indicates you are better than the unforgiven. 
Unforgiveness indicates you are better than the unforgiven. That sounds kind of, I don't think I agree with that, Brother J.R. I don't like how that sounds. But we don't have to like something for it to be true. If you can't agree with this statement, think about this. If Christ has forgiven you of all iniquity, why then are you not forgiving others for just hurting you or sinning against you in some way? God incarnate, the flesh, came to this earth, died for all of us to forgive us of every single thing that we did or doing and will do. Future sense, because he was 2,000 years ago. Why are we not forgiving other people? What's stopping that? You remember what Satan's big issue was? Pride. Can you imagine people walking in and out of church and just thinking that they're better than other people? Could you imagine that? Forgiveness should be instinctive, natural. Because if we're calling ourselves Christians, which literally, mean, literally means to be Christ-like, to be like Him, then it should be instinctive. It should be natural for us to be like, it's, I'm, I forgive you. One thing that I developed a habit of years ago uh, with Haley, whenever we got married, I told her, I said, look, we're, we're not going to say it's okay whenever we do something wrong or say or whatnot. We're just not going to say that. Anybody else? Say it's okay. After you do something wrong and then you're trying to apologize and in response you say it's okay. Is it okay? What Haley and I have gotten in the habit of doing whenever I go up and tell her that I'm a knothead and I did something dumb. It's pretty obvious. And I say, I love you. Please forgive me. Or I'll say, I'm sorry. I love you. And she'll respond with, I love you and thank you. But yet we say it's okay. In our subconscious, because we still have a childlike mind, all of us know, I'm sorry, but if you're like 105 years old, you still have a childlike mind in God's eyes that we still think this way, that if we say it's okay, in our back of our mind, it's okay. Hey, it's not that big of a deal. But the second you respond with an I love you, which is God's response to all of us in that he forgives us, with, I love you, Jesus. <laughs> We're supposed to be Christ-like. Jeff uh, stole a, a, a uh, quote I was going to use earlier about C.S. Lewis, and he's already said it, and that's spot on. It's <laughs> Forgiveness is so wonderful until we have to practice it. This is painful because it's lowering ourselves and yet elevating another person to forgiving them, it's no longer holding whatever wrong they have done accountable to them. But here's the issue that's going on in this church. Paul is the one that was hurt. Some people like to get behind the idea that Paul is referencing a specific situation because something happened in the church that caused a problem. Some people and other commentators I don't agree with have said, well, this is the 1 Corinthians chapter 5 guy that was having a relationship with his stepmother, and they kicked him out of the church. They think that this is who this is. Not necessarily just because of how these few verses are written. I don't think that that's the case. What I believe it happened, because he explains of why he came to them, I believe what happened in his second trip to go see the church Someone stood up, rallied the troops, and just chewed Paul out publicly and tried to berate him. And then we have this letter, that, or the letter that they had written to Paul, accusing him further of whatever the situation was, just accusing him of vacillating. That's that word we talked about last week, just basically saying one thing and doing another and not really being serious with planning to go and see them. I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's the case of the individual that was having a relationship with his stepmother. I think this individual stood up in the church or elsewhere in public and publicly tried to humiliate Paul. Paul left. He rallied all the church people together and got them on his side. Now they realize, hey, we're wrong. And this person essentially possibly even outwitted the rest of the church. Basically duped him into behaving this way. And I'll come back to that point in verse 11. 
But you see, Paul is the one that was actually hurt. And he's telling him, listen, I'm not even hurt by this. It's okay. Because it's instinctive that he's forgiven them. That it's over. And he points out the fact that you are all still hurt by this. And I guess rightly so because it's such a public issue. But again, it isn't natural for them to immediately forgive. They still want to hold on to it. And you'll see what happens in the next few verses. But Paul is telling me it's fine. But I, I see that you've caused pain. So then here's the remedy. This is what we need to do going forward. But unforgiveness does cause church-wide pain. Look at verse, or before we get to verse uh, 6 through 8. Anybody know where Woodbine, Texas is? No, I've never heard of it. But evidently, there was a situation, this was some years back, Dr. John Rice, who's a famous uh, evangelist here in Texas, uh, was gone to be with the Lord. But he was asked to come down to a Baptist church at Woodbine, Texas, where there were divisions. I'm talking like the two families, the Hatfield McCoys kind of situation here in Woodbine, Texas. And they knew about it. And this pastor had been dealing with this church that they literally sat on opposite sides of the church. They went through different doors, would not interact with each other. It wasn't even a family thing. It had nothing to do with families. Just everybody was angry at everybody. Everybody just hated everybody. So imagine that. Nobody goes out that door, but you all go at those doors. I mean, you can't even talk to one another. But Dr. Rice was asked to come and preach at this church. And... And I'll say the pastors could have delivered the same sermon, but there's a whole other ecclesial thing there. But he came and he preached. He witnessed what was going on, trying to talk to people, and he stood up, convicted by the Holy Spirit to preach God's word, stood up and preached against the sin of just unforgiveness, about the hatefulness they're committing to one another. Guess what happened? Well, they all hated him. So at least they were all together in the fact that they hated that preacher. Woo! But a, a mother who was absolutely beside herself angry was about to call and give that preacher a piece of her mind. Picked up the phone to call and she evidently told the whole family and the son, 19 years old, walks up and says, Mom, you're wrong. And he said this, Mother, you are wrong. I have just been out in the woods to pray. I know Brother Rice is right. If we Christians do not get right with each other, we can never have a revival. And it's not meaning the actual event. It means what Christ is, what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts and minds. And that comes by effective preaching of the gospel and of the word. If we Christians do not get right with each other, we cannot have revival. I, I for one, am going to try to get right. His mother did not make the phone call. The next service, Dr. Rice called for a time of testimony. With tears streaming down her eyes, that mother stood up and walked forward and confessed that she had been harboring unforgiveness for a specific individual in the church. That woman, tears streaming down her face, walked forward. They hugged it out. They loved each other. And for the rest of the service, everybody was confessing sin problems, dealing with issues publicly, and the church lived in harmony since. It spread like wildfire. Wild fire. After that, the church was flooded with people. Dozens and dozens of people started coming to Christ after the pastor returned. It continued because of the effective preaching of God's word. Hundreds of Christians were revived and people came from miles to fill the church. Just because people started to forgive each other, they started to communicate with one another, they started to deal with the issues. But look at verse 6 on to 8. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be over or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. 
So we, that's all the details we know of. There's an individual that has been pushed out of the church, and now Paul's fear is, look, it, I'm the one that should be hurt, but I'm not. I know you're hurt, but now it's time to fix this situation. How do you fix the situation? You forgive and comfort the person. It's easy to forgive, but now you want me to love on the person? Because then that shows that's an outward expression of the true heart of forgiveness of the person. You want to forgive people, it accompanies comfort. You regain fellowship and love for those individuals and those people that have sinned against us. Not just hurt our feelings. There's no scripture in all of the Bible that actually says anything about hurt feelings. I, I, I'm sorry. I, if you find it, please tell me. And I'll stand up here behind the pulpit and say, here, according to First Opinions chapter 5, it says, do, do not hurt my feelings. <laughs> Lest we give you the cat of nine tails. I mean, it's not, I just don't see it, but prove me wrong, please. But he is pointing out the fact that this punishment, having removed them, just like he did in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 to that other individual, they said, put him out to Satan. Not literally, hey, Satan, this guy's yours. It's not that. It's literally putting him out into the world that he is so aching to be a part of. That's what that means. This is whose world out there? It's Satan's world. God has, and I've preached on this before, God has given him the leash to run. But he's telling him, listen, this, this is a big enough deal to put a person out from the church and now it's time to forgive them and bring them back in comfort because, because he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Now here's an emotional scripture. Because it does talk about being sorrowful, which is an emotional reaction. Depression. We don't want anybody in the congregation to become depressed. We need to figure out how we can get them in the joy of the Lord. But in this situation, they need to be comforted. But this, this word overwhelmed literally means consumed. So your point this morning that I want you to get is too long in sorrow will, being, will lead to being made a meal of by Satan. Too long in sorrow will lead to being made a meal of by Satan. Well, that seems like more analogous, like an analogy, Brother J.R. No, no, no. Think about another scripture that you're very familiar with, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says this. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to eat, consume. That's what that word means. We don't take Satan seriously. Yes, he is a defeated enemy. He is absolutely defeated. Praise God. It gives me chill bumps to know that the enemy has no teeth insofar as our salvation separating us from God. For this world, he is seeking to eat people, consume them, now, we all know, and I tell this, have said this from the pulpit before, obviously Satan is not omnipresent. He, he is not everywhere and anywhere. But do you not think a general is leading his soldiers the way they ought to go? Ultimately, is him being the general to his demons, to his followers, those who have followed him and wished to drag as many people down as humanly possible. And they are looking for the individuals that are being put out from the church, that are convicted by their sinfulness, that are having issues in their lives, that are just uncomforted, unloved, because they have done something wrong. And in this case, the church has put the person out and has forgotten about them. We've, we've done right, Brother J.R. We finally did church discipline. We executed it right. That person has been put out. The church is, is growing and it's great. Now it's time to go love that person because they need to be brought back in. Because otherwise you are hanging them out where the enemy will easily come after them and eat them. That should be the goal. And it's, oh gosh, now I have to forgive somebody. And now I need to comfort them? Look at, and he, he, verse 8, he says, I beg you. The, the pastor is begging. It should be begging that we should forgive one another. Forgive anybody in our family. It's begging. Listen, I love y'all. 
if there is anything in your heart where you are harboring unforgiveness for any family member, any friends, anybody in the church, anybody in the communities, anybody in your home church, anybody where you're from, anywhere you go, if you are harboring unforgiveness, number one, you need to get right with God because we can't force other people to get right with God. All we can do is get our heart right with God. That is a hard lesson I had to learn years ago. I can't force other people to do right, but I can change me. I may want other people to do right, but I can't. All I can do is take care of me. And where it says be sober-minded is talking about us. It's the individuals need to fix their brain, get their mind right, focus on where it needs to be. Verse 9 says this, For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Here's, this is where we can do it corporately together. That we ask one another, we communicate with one another. Are you doing what God has called you to do? Are you forgiving people? Have you forgiven somebody of their hurt? If you come to me and tell me, hey, I'm, I'm dealing with this, with this thing in my life. I'm going through this struggle. I, I, here's the problem. I'll go ahead and tell you all. If you haven't come to me with that, I'm going to ask you about it in a couple of weeks. You have now given me permission by coming to me and saying, hey, I'm struggling with this. You have now given me permission to come to you and say, have you dealt with that? Have you communicated with those individuals? Have, what, have you, what steps have been taken to deal with this issue? How is your relationship with God now, having dealt with that issue? Peter, Paul is not telling the church, listen, I'm testing your obedience to him. No, it's not about his, the obedience to Paul. He could care less. He wants people to be obedient to God. But we're so worried about what other people think about us and just checking, hey, do you still love me? Are we okay? We're good? <clears throat> Fix yourself right with God. Check your obedience to Him. Are you being obedient in every aspect of God's Word? One biggie is, as He said here, forgive and comfort. Reaffirm your love for everyone. Let's look on. But Paul, as I've said, has told us that we are, we are to check ourselves in everything. Ephesians 4, 32, Be kind and compassionate to, any, to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. We're still supposed to be like Christ, right? Are we, are we being obedient to that? For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, didn't say hurt your feelings. There it is. It says sin against you. Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6, 14. Are you being obedient to God's word? Bear with, one, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave. It didn't say any other steps in between that. It said if you have a grievance against somebody, you have a problem with somebody, forgive. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Look on at verse 10 through 11. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. In, indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Last part for your notes. You are duped by Satan if you have an unforgiving heart. That's huge. You are tricked by Satan. You are right where he wants you to be ineffective for his work. If you're harboring unforgiveness... I use the word duped. But you are outwitted by a very smart being that's been here for thousands of years that has been playing this game longer than any of our descendants. <laughs> well, technically not really Adam and Eve. But do, you, do you think he's stupid? Do you think he's ignorant? Do you think he, not, he does not know how to 
wiggle his way into our lives to infiltrate us and to ruin our walk, to ruin our obedience to God, to make it so that other people will not come to Christ, to ruin your testimony, to ruin your work, to ruin your happiness, your joy that God gives you, to make you so ineffective. He's telling them, listen, I've already forgiven them. And this isn't a big deal. Forgive. We make it a big deal with problems of pride in our life. Maybe even fear. But what do we fear whenever we try to forgive a person? We're scared they're not going to accept our forgiveness? That's on them. But he says this is... He says something very interesting. If I have forgiven anything, it has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. Meaning heavenly. It's not something meant for here. Our forgiveness does not have any bearing on this earth. It has eternal bearing in God's presence before Christ. That's where it matters. That's why we need to get right with God because it's affecting our eternal nature. It's affecting our relationship with Him. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his designs. This is why I go back and think that in in verse 5 where it talks about this whole situation coming about. Is that I believe, why would he bring up Satan right here at the end of this little sentence? or this last part, if it wasn't something related to somebody infiltrating the church and outwitting everybody and causing a problem. It wasn't something so immoral, something immoral as it was in chapter 5, 1 Corinthians. But it was something that caused the church so much embarrassment and so many problems. We don't know what it is. I'm sorry. I'm not going to be able to guess accurately. I can guesstimate that it had something to do with this individual whom he is talking about causing the whole church to get up behind him and accompany him in writing that letter to the pastor and saying, you are vacillating. You are a terrible pastor. You're horrible. You're ugly. You're mean. You're blah, blah, blah. And now they sit back and be like, we were wrong. And now we're all embarrassed. And it caused such a public of evil because it causes pain in the church. If there's unforgiveness, it, it's going to affect us. It's going to affect our issues. If you don't believe me, it had nothing to do with uh, forgiveness, but multiple, many of you last week and the week before would come up to me like, are you okay? Are you okay? Brother JR, is everything okay? Uh, I had a conversation with Mike Hale the other day. He asked me, are you okay? Is everything okay? And said, uh, because she's not in here, she can't hit me. Uh, (laughs) Diane was like, Diane had told him, I don't even see Mike right now. I know he's here. Uh, There he is. (laughs) But he said, does does she need to come up here and give you a mama talk? I'm like, (laughs) I may need it. If 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 I'm affected outwardly so much, yes, I probably need it. And I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to be above these kind of things, right? It's so easy. It's easy to talk to Brother JR about these things, but it should be even easier to talk to one another and deal with these things and deal with whatever issues. When we don't deal with it, we are causing harm to the church and its growth. We are causing harm to our spiritual growth and maturity. If that is the case, we are not going to grow this world for the kingdom. How effective are we going to be in our families if we're bitter and angry at people in the church, haven't dealt with issues, haven't forgiven people? Somebody comes up and says, hey, I'll watch your children. And I don't want to watch, don't want you watch my children. You did this, that, and the other. Me, me, me. Do you need some help fixing whatever? No, you you were ugly and hurt my feelings. I fear for the church, the global church, because here's the truth. We are being duped by Satan daily. Parents, Satan wants you to know, you you don't need to raise your children. Let the state do it. Let the world figure out ideologies and things in this world to, to train your child up. Let us tell you what to, what to be acceptant of. 
grandparents. Tell Satan wants you to know that you have no place in in the stewardship or in the parentage of your children right now. That's malarkey. Can I say malarkey from the pulpit? That's an old redneck word. I did said it twice. Students and teenagers and children, Satan wants you to know that you are, that you're worthless in this world. Satan wants you to know that. God wants you to know that you are valuable and you are precious. And that we should demonstrate the same forgiveness that He extended to this whole world to everyone around us. How can we, for, how can we say that we, have, we are Christ-like and we have accepted this forgiveness for our sinfulness and yet we don't practice it for everyone else? He forgave us of all of our iniquities. Why? Because He loves us. Because we are valuable to Him. But we don't see that to everybody else. God wants us to be so natural 